Welcome to Horsepower, Chrome, and Rust, covering car culture and the automotive world with Shane Osborne, Brady Wright, and Steve, the producer, Johan. Let's see what's up this week. <laughs> well, here's what's happening. It's Tuesday, December 23rd, and you know, we are just that close to Christmas 2019. Yes, we Brady are. Brady Wright, Shane Osborne, Steve, the producer, Johan. There's a ton of listeners joining in because tonight is going to be kind of a special night. First off, it's the 117th episode of Horsepower, Chrome, and Rust. But second off, because it's Christmas, we thought we would give you kind of a special treat. And I'm not going to tell you what it is just yet, but coming up in the second segment, believe me, this is worth the read and worth the listen tonight. (laughs) It includes video and music, and it's going to be a lot of fun. First, however... As we always do. Oh, by the way, I guess I should say Shane is not in the studio tonight because Shane is exploring the wilds of sunny California for two weeks. We hate him. Um, (laughs) But he'll be back. And uh, in the meantime, you know, we're hoping he's having some fun with uh, his daughter and his family. So first segment, as always, is back to the blacktop. Steve Johan has automotive news and information as per usual. Well, as we know, it is on the very eve of Christmas 2019, and uh, for all those who know, we all know that uh, we like Santa Claus, Rudolph, and we like all that stuff, but really the focus of Christmas is the Christ child, the Savior who saved the world. Of course. And I think it's really cool. It's the reason for the season. It's the reason for the season. And as part of that, it's it's he came here to give a gift of his life. And so we want to kind of give you a gift of this show. We've been doing it for over two years. And I just want to say thank you to all of our listeners. And uh, we've got a few of you who really connect with us on a regular basis. Big kudos for you um, for that. And I yeah. um, appreciate that. But uh, I thought Thanks, it would. Thanks, Mom. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mom, mom listens. My so wife our, doesn't even listen. Our listenership is doubled because that's right. <laughs> but anyway, that said, here's a few auto-related uh, news items to ah. cover. Really cool update from Phoenix-based truck company, and I've talked about these guys before, called Nicola Motor Company. It has claimed that it has developed the holy grail of batteries, ah. a new technology that can pack about twice as much energy into a given mass, while also having the price compared to today's lithium-ion technology. Ah, holds a charge, doesn't leak? Uh, yes. The prefer- That'd be the holy grail of batteries. Well, it would. <laughs> and the purported breakthrough comes as uh, something of a surprise considering the source. Nikola Motor Company first gained attention for its plan to roll out a series of semi-trucks replacing conventional diesel engines with hydrogen fuel cells. Right. I remember this. Yes. Well, the new batteries would In fact, offer- we talked about it on the show. Yes, we did. And the new batteries would offer similar range as much as 800 miles on a charge, only slightly less than what you get a modern truck with a diesel truck right. on a tank of fuel. And according to Trevor Milton, founder and CEO of Nikola, they are not talking about small improvements, but really doubling the range of a BEV, hydrogen electric vehicles around the world. And they, they, they cool. said basically they acquired a startup. And it is in the process of acquiring and will move to commercializing the technology once the deal is completed. Nice. It plans to demonstrate the batteries next autumn during the annual event dubbed the Nikola World. Now, apparently, it appears that the key to the battery is removing the binder material and the electric current collectors used in today's lithium-ion cells. I was just going to say that. Not only the size and the (laughs) weight. You know, the question that I have about this, and I, you may have this already over there, the, it, having a more efficient battery is great. The key thing is going to be recharge time. It says, but also makes the new batteries more conducive translating into faster charging time. Excellent, because that's the that's It the is. Thing. That's the key. But I have been kind of talking about this for years. They've got to come up with a different way of, instead of, linking all these small little batteries together to yeah. make a big, huge cell. Run them in series. Yeah. You've got to come up with something completely different. Yeah. And it sounds like maybe they've got something going here. So we, we need, will we find out. We need the out. arc reactor from Iron Man. I've always thought that they need <laughs> to do something with silicone, but I don't know. I'm, I don't, well, there's you know, a lot of cool things done with silicone, but. Yeah, the chips. You can sure, sure, power up and build a lot of capacity in there. But who knows? It'll be interesting to see. We'll see. There's a few naysayers out there doubting if that's true. But let's put it this way. If they can actually do what they're doing, it won't only fit in their trucks. They'll have the market. Well, sure. I mean, any any kind of 
super efficient, quick charging battery that doesn't leak or have yes. any hazmat. You know, that's that is the holy grail, and that will radically change the transportation industry if they can make it work. That's and, and right. There's a ton of money to be made over there. Oh, a, you know, a ton, just a, a ton, a trillions. Literal, <laughs> ton <laughs> yes yes there are, yeah it'll, it'll it'll they'll More have to use tons. one of their trucks to pull the amount they of will. money that they're going to get they will uh speaking of electrics bmw stated they will have sold five hundred thousand electric cars by the end of 2019 which to be honest is a sizable amount that's not bad half a million yeah that's good but that's just bmw i'm very sure. surprised and then comes this from Volkswagen, who is also in the EV game, with reports surfacing it as having software problems with its newly developed ID.3 all-electric crossovers, which could affect as many as 20,000 vehicles. Wow. So the ID.3 yep. was what replaced the ID.10T. Yep. <laughs> here, here, Sorry. Here, <laughs> here we go. That was <laughs> just... <laughs> it's there's dot what, three. There's what, point yeah. two. Point, point three. Yeah. yeah, it's like two point uh, Yes, uh, Q three and all that crap. <laughs> anyway, and then here's Don't another one. Tell him. Don't tell him. Go ahead. Yes, 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 yes. For GM <laughs> pickup owners, you will not like this. GM issued two recalls covering more than nine hundred thousand vehicles due to software and fire problems. Now, last week we talked about the carpets ca catching on fire. This would be bad. Well, now it's got software issues, and that is, affects mostly GM, late models, full-size pickup trucks. I would prefer software challenges to having the rugs on fire. Yeah. I mean, given the choice. Now, maybe the software ignites and starts the rugs on no, fire. It's, it's going to be something, it's, it's going to be hardware that ignites. Yes. Software's not going to ignite squat. That's true. But, uh, yeah, I'm sure. 900,000, that's still a lot. That's of, a lot. Yeah, that's a lot. Jeez. Now, if they could just plug it in and re, re, uh, reboot it, mm -hmm. that might be a fairly inexpensive fix for them to do. Sure. Um, and speaking of GM, did you notice that our local dealership, uh, it's actually called Seaview Buick, and that's not a plug. It's just the name. Buick GMC. Buick GMC. Yeah. They went away from, sh they lost the Chevy moniker many, many years ago. Well, yeah, they, they gave up the route because the, there's guys down the street that have a big Chevy dealership. Right. But Chevy used to be on every corner. Now they're limited. <laughs> well, now GM, their portion of GM is gone. If Their building is empty. The GM side of things is empty down here. And oh, because the lot's full of trucks. No, there's nothing in it. As of when? This last week. Just go buy it. I did. I drove by it on the way home to Nate. There were dirt trucks out there, I thought. Well, there's nothing on I mean, the inside of the building. Oh, maybe. I mean, I didn't look at the building. Well, they still have the Buick side, so they may yeah. be selling everything through there, and yeah, they're yeah, yeah. going to do maybe something else with it. trucks. I don't know. Yeah. It's oh, interesting. interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, we hate to see that, but... Uh, well, it, yeah. GM, <laughs> GM makes a pretty decent truck. Yeah. And now here's something we don't often talk about, but a deal with every time we use a pickup truck. I was reviewing a article about tailgates, and a lot of new improvements have been making their way onto the latest trucks. Today, you'll find barn door style tailgates, oh, tailgates yes. that can be folded down into sections. Mm -hmm. They got the commercial where kind of like drop it's two or three, and then yep. they step up. Other designs have built in steps and several cases and audio systems and a whole definition Coolers. of tailgate parties would yeah. be uh oh, yeah. benefited there. And that's just the beginning. Apparent Rivian has come up with a patent for a tailgate that would drop completely out of the way. So it comes down and drops straight down instead of ah. partly out. Okay. Now the old trucks used to do that. All the older oh, trucks yeah, in the forties and stuff, they all came all the way down yeah. before you put chains on there. Well, and because they had a piano hinge and it was easy. Yeah. And Tesla Cybertruck includes electronically extendable ramp that uh, there's a <laughs> of picture of it. Does. Yeah. And there's even a, a Hyundai design that would allow the tailgate to slide back to the extend the vehicle's cargo bed. And so I got to thinking, <laughs> why not build one that you can actually do an RV ramp with it? Because An RV ramp? Yeah, a motorcycle ramp oh, built I see. into like an for an ATV or something. Yeah, or so device. it may be four parts that drop, drop, drop sure. down, and now you can go right into it. We need a hot and cold running scotch, but stripper pole. I mean, all that stuff is. I mean, well, for later, you motorcycle guys, I guess that's for you. Wouldn't, wouldn't you? <laughs> well, stick with us. We're going to be right back with some really cool stories about a very famous car on the Horsepower Chrome and Rust Show. My mind out of gear. And my heart's in overdrive 
I've everything to fear. I ain't never been more alive. <laughs> Yeah, Horsepower Chrome and Rust is back. This is the first half of the Windshield View, our Christmas Eve show. And this week, we are going to do something a little bit different by way of bringing you a holiday treat. Now, it's impossible. It is impossible to be a car guy and or a car woman and not know about the Hot Rod Lincoln. Everybody knows uh, you have got either you've heard the song or you know the story or you wanted one or you know the phrase. I mean, if I say... Son, you're going to drive me to drinking. The only official follow-up to that line is, <laughs> if you don't quit driving that hot rod Lincoln. Everybody knows the thing. But the question that we have, and for those of you who've listened to the show for a while, you may know the answer. Do you know the whole story? Because for a lot of people, it's the song, or it's the semi-joke, or it's the story. But there actually was a hot rod Lincoln. There was actually... A, song, a story behind the song, and the song, as some people know, but we're going to go through it tonight, uh, was written by a guy named Charlie Ryan. It was written some years ago. And one of the nice things about having David Dickinson's Old Car Nut books is that in Old Car Nut Book 2, he compiled and put together the entire history of the actual Hot Rod Lincoln. Now, we did this once before about two years ago, and David was kind enough to come up and actually read the story, and I, I'm not, I'm doing it tonight because I can, not because I'm any better than he is. He did a marvelous job. But uh, we have some new information that we did not have the last time we did it, and uh, David's having a holiday, so I'm going to do it tonight. But the other thing we did last time was we played Charlie Ryan's original version of the song Hot Rod Lincoln, which is different from what a lot of people remember, because here's the deal. Back in the 60s, Charlie wrote the song, and he released it on a on a label. But Gene Autry, who is a country star, also owned a ton of radio stations, and he had a kind of protege whose name was Johnny Bond. And Gene wanted Johnny to have a hit. He recognized the song was going to be a, a hit. And uh, so he had Johnny record it, and he gave a lot wider distribution of that song to the Johnny Bond version. And Johnny, it charted, and it went in. I, actually, it, was, it charted twice, but we're going to have that story out a little bit. So here's what we're going to do. We're, tonight, we're going to do the whole story of the Hot Rod Lincoln. You're going to love this. If you have not ever before thought about recording the show, hit play now. Record this thing because it's going to be worthwhile. Of course, you can go back and listen to it on the net anytime you want to, but you really do want your own copy, don't you? Anyway, we're going to start by playing the song. This is the Johnny Bond version of the Charlie Ryan song, Ha Rod Lincoln. Now you've heard the story of the Hot Rod race when the Ford and the Mercury was setting a pace. That story is true, I'm here to say, because I was a driving that Model A. Really souped up that Model A body makes it look like a pup. It's got eight cylinders and use them all with an overdrive that just won't stall. Got a four barrel car and a dual exhaust, four eleven gears that can really get lost. Got safety tubes and I'm not scared. The brakes are good and the tires are fair. We left San Pedro late one night. The moon and the stars were shining bright. Everything went fine up the grapevine hill. We was passing cars like they were standing still. Then all of a sudden, like the flick of an eye, a Cadillac sedan passed us by. The remark was made, that's the car for me, but to then the tail light was all you could see. Well, the fellers ribbed me for being behind, so I started to make that Lincoln unwind. Took my foot off the gas, and man alive, I shoved it down into overdrive. Well, I wound it up to 110, twisted the speedometer cable off the end, had my foot be clear to the floor, says that's all there is, there ain't no more. Truck. I crossed my fingers just for luck. The fenders clicking the guardrail post. The guy beside me, white as a ghost. I guess they thought I'd lost my sense. The telephone poles looked like a picket fence. He said, slow down. I see spots. The lines in the road, they just look like dots. Smoke was rolling out of the back. When I started to gain on that Cadillac, I knew I could catch him and I hope I could pass. But when I did, I'd be short on gas. Tires on the side, you can feel the tension, man, what a ride. I said, hold on, I got a license to 
to fly in a Cadillac, pulled over and left me by. Then all of a sudden, the rod started knocking. Down in the depths, she started to rock. And I looked in the mirror, and the red light was blinking. The cops were left, and my heart was aching. Well, they arrested me, and they put me in jail. I called my pop to go my bail. He said, son, you're going to drive me to drinking if you don't quit driving out of hot rod Lincoln. That's it. So this thing was popular in the 50s, the 60s, really. And, of course, it, it harkened back to an earlier age of hot rods and racing and, and just, you know, the original kind of pup-bodied uh, rods that people built in the 40s and the 50s. And the story that we have from the old car nut book, too, is called Hot Rod Lincoln. It's written by Bob Davidson. And Bob Davidson is a guy who is in the auto body business in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, he some of the names that are going to be coming up in this, sh- in this uh, story will be people that you know of, especially if you listen to the show. Now, all of this took place in the Pacific Northwest, just south of the, of the city of Tacoma. So I, I want you to j- kind of get this picture and and kind of take this trip with me. This starts about 1987, so it was a good 30 years after the song, Mm -hmm. you know, was popular. In all the years that I was in the auto body industry, I repaired a lot of cars and met a lot of people. Because I love cars and people, it was always a thrill for me. In the beginning, I worked for what had been a one-man shop. I would come in to sand and mask the cars, and the guy that owned the shop would come in and spray them at night. We'd get some cars off the car lots to repair and make a living. Over time, it grew and grew and grew to where it became one of the largest collision companies in the area by far. He became very successful and very wealthy. For me, it was just one of the stepping stones in life. I met lots of interesting people at that shop, and one day... In about 1987, an older couple came in and got an estimate on their late model Nova. As I'm writing up the estimate, the gentleman says to me, that's a 30 Model A up there on the wall, isn't it? He was pointing to a picture behind me that I didn't even know was there. But it was in a nice frame and everything, and I turned around and said, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, it it sure is. Now, the old boy was about 70 years old. I'd say his wife was sitting on the couch waiting for him to get his estimate and complete it, and he says, I got one of those. I said, oh, well, you do. Well, how cool is that? He said, yeah, I got a Lincoln motor in it. I chuckled and said, oh, like the hot rod Lincoln? I rattled it off just like that. He continued, not a bit swayed by my casual responses. Yes, I have the original hot rod Lincoln. Wow. I couldn't believe what he was saying. I asked, did did you write the song? Oh, yeah, he replied, long time ago. I asked, where's the car at? (laughs) Well, we're retiring in McKenna, and we rented a trailer There, we got a metal garage down there, and I have all my stuff in there. It's in there, too. Having a hard time buying into his statements, I said, can can we come and see it? He says, yeah. When I bring my car in, you can give me a ride home. So I called my friend, Walt Kaplan, who was really into music, and I asked him who wrote the song, Hot Rod Lincoln, and he knew it just like that. He said, Charlie Ryan. I shouted, are you kidding me? He just left here. He said, are you kidding me? Where's the car? And I went on to tell him about the guy and his wife and the car out in McKenna. About the time I hung up with Walt, my buddy Dick Page came in the door, and I told him the story. I said, he's bringing his late model car in for repairs on Monday, and I'm going to give him a ride back home. He says he'll take me down and show me the car. You want to come with me? And Dick said, absolutely. So on Monday, Dick was at the shop right on time, and I introduced him to Charlie when he came in. We took Charlie back to his place, anxious to make kind of a historical barn find. And walking down to the metal building, the anticipation swelled in our hearts and our minds. I will never forget the moment when Charlie opened that big old door of the building and I looked in. And there, in the dark recesses, the sunlight dancing over the front grill shell, motor, and faded red cowl sat the Hot Rod Lincoln. I asked if it even ran, and Charlie told me, it hadn't been started or driven in many years. We walked around the car, looked it over. It had mattresses on it and pigeons flying in and out and junk all over the place. And I looked at Dick and said, wouldn't it be awesome if we could restore this thing and bring it back to life? And old Charlie looked at me and said, oh, I can't afford that. I smiled and said, oh, wait a minute, Charlie. And you know what? I'm going to tell you the rest of that story on the other side of the break. You stick right with us. This is Horsepower Chrome and Rust. Merry Christmas. My old stomping ground 
Uh, we're back. It's the second half of the Windshield View, the special Christmas version. We are telling the story of the Hot Rod Lincoln. This is the greatest automotive info show in the known world, and I'm telling you, tonight <laughs> we're living up to our name. Yep. We left off with Charlie Ryan, the writer of the song and the owner of the Hot Rod Lincoln, saying he couldn't afford to get the thing restored. Well, Bob Davidson smiled and said, wait a minute now, Charlie, I'll tell you what. I'll get it done, and it won't cost you a dime. If you've got any other parts, well, he had the taillights off the Lincoln real handy and some other stuff and boxes, and as he looked around, he told me the story right then and there. Now, many people have heard the song Hot Rod Lincoln. It had been recorded numerous times by various artists. It'll always be part of the fabric of early rock and roll or rockabilly music. What a majority of the casual listening public doesn't know is the history of the car behind the song or that there even was a real car. Well... There have been quite a few things written about Charlie Ryan and the Hot Rod Lincoln. They don't always say the same thing, but here's what Charlie told Bob. Charlie had a band, and they rode around in a 1947 Lincoln Zephyr from one gig to the next. And after the guys were done playing, they'd throw their instruments up on the roof and head out to their next stop. Now, Charlie was always writing lyrics down. He'd sit in the back seat, sipping on a beer or two, scribbling lyrics and humming new tunes while they drove to the next venue. They did quite a bit of this routine after their gigs, Charlie writing songs, some of which were about the Lincoln, not putting the year of the car or anything down, just lyrics about a hot rod Lincoln. The song never seemed to want to be completed, and this went on for quite some time. That all changed one night. On one outing, they were going from New Mexico into Texas and then into Oklahoma and finally up the coast of California, where they rolled the Lincoln one night. Everybody got out safely, but the car was destroyed. So they took it to a wrecking yard that Charlie's dad owned because it was near Bakersfield, California. The Lincoln body was taken off the chassis and a Model A body was put on it. Now this is when the unfinished song kind of took a new direction. Charlie started to add the lyrics about the Model A and it all started to come together. The 12-cylinder engine was in its original place as he went on with his lyrics and the new kind of voice of the song. When some of the lyrics in the song refer to a Cadillac passing him by, it had actually been the 47 Lincoln in some of the original lyrics. The references to the Model A and the Cadillac came after they had rolled the Lincoln. <laughs> so he told me this whole story about how they finally finished the song, and a record company immediately wanted him to record it. Well, he did. A Johnny Bond recorded it, too, and it got on the hit parade at about the same time with both recordings. Charlie was an artist himself, but Johnny Bond was Gene Autry's sidekick, and he wanted to do the song in his own style. That recording went right up to the top immediately, and all kinds of attention came his way. Now, once in a while, Charlie would take the car and park it outside a gig like a Grange Hall or something where he was performing with his band, the Rough Riders, to draw attention and pull the people inside. It wasn't the car we see today or the quality you expect to see today in a promotional car. In fact, other than the few people that saw the car at those venues that Charlie played and the band played and displayed the car, most people listening to the music on the radio or records only thought of the car as whatever their mind conjured up. So, as Dick and I stood in the garage, surveying the car, the restoration kind of played out in our minds. We evaluated what was there and what was going to be needed, as well as who we might be able to get involved. Now, this restoration was our way of helping Charlie, a living legend in the mind of many, and preserving the car that had become so iconic to those that knew it even existed. For others, this would be the beginning of a completely new era for the song, the car, and for Charlie and Ruthie Ryan. Now, Charlie was certainly agreeable, but he wanted to know why this wasn't costing him anything. We reassured him that that was our way of giving back, and so he turned the car over to me and let us do our thing. Charlie didn't realize the basic irresistible urge and the ultimate satisfaction that an old hot rodder could get from being involved in the restoration of a car of this legendary status. Mm -hmm. Everybody we approached and asked for help was anxious to get involved, and all the time, materials, and the funds were donated from the new white wall tires to the paint. It was all for Charlie, and it was all given freely with nothing expected in return. We didn't take or ask for anything. And because of the nature of the build and the excitement that it generated, there was always a good, a lot of goodwill floating around, and so there was a lot of attention given to the companies that were involved. It worked out good. We took it over to Benny Jones. He had a little mechanical garage. His dad was Levi Jones, the race car driver, so he had a lot of equipment, and Benny got it all when his dad passed away. He got the 47 Zephyr engine fired up in not much time at all. And after all those years it was running and we went and got a hold of other people to donate their talent, Benny had donated his time and resources. Then we started the bodywork, the interior, the remaining mechanical restoration of the vehicle. Now, the person that did the interior, Don McLeod, got credit for the upholstery work he did on the side. Winchell's did the bodywork at their shop on Pacific Avenue in Tacoma. The hood, as it was, uh, needed to be refabbed, so we cut and reshaped a hood that we 
uh, would go from the cowl to the grill shell. We also made a smooth top for it out of tin. Charlie still had the Model A taillights on it, so we removed them and took out some round 49 Lincoln taillights and mounted them in the fenders, giving it a real neat look. The rear bumpers we put on were from a 48 Lincoln. We got a van company to donate a spare tire cover that they put on the custom vans, and I painted and lettered it to look like a 45 RPM record label of the song. Oh, cool. We gave it new hubcaps, put brand new white wall tires on it, which it hadn't had before, and the man that donated the tires got credit for his tire company. So some of the things in the original Lincoln went on to the Model A body that he wanted to incorporate but had never done. He still had all the pieces and parts, and we made a lot of it work. We put the Lincoln dashboard in it, and I lettered the notes and the lyrics on it. On the one side, on the left side of the steering column, above the gauges, I put, Son, you're going to drive me to drinking. And on the other side, just to the right of the clock, I finished with, If you don't stop driving, that hot rod Lincoln. Still there today. (laughs) The chrome and stainless on the dash shone like new, and the lettering really made it all pop. It got a nice new leather interior to replace the old ragged seat that was in there and other things we could do to make it kind of a show car. There are pictures of all of this being built, and Rod and Custom Magazine wrote an article to show the pictures and tell the story. It was just amazing. And Charlie and his wife were blown away at all the attention. They couldn't believe what was going on. Now, to upgrade the car and make it more safe and durable than what they'd thrown together back in the late 40s, we took care of any mechanical work. The 47 Zephyr motor wasn't rebuilt, but it got new suspension and brake work and whatever else was needed. It was all done right, with no corners cut. Charlie and Ruthie Ryan were amazed at how the car turned out. So the redone Hot Rod Lincoln made its debut at Rock the Dock, which is downtown on the waterfront in the city of Tacoma. They put the car up on uh, up above, and Charlie performed with a band that he put together out of the local union. There was a car show inside as well, and it was an awesome event to introduce everybody to Charlie and the freshened-up Hot Rod Lincoln. A lot of people said, oh, you duplicated the old Hot Rod. We explained, no, 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 this is the original Hot Rod Lincoln. It's not a reproduction. And even with all the publicity that was floating around, there were a lot of people that didn't realize there even had been an original mm-hmm. Hot Rod Lincoln. They took the car to some of the big car shows like Good Guys. They bought brand new jackets to go with the theme. And at 72 years old, Charlie started to perform again on a regular basis. The magazines got a hold of this and everything started to grow. Charlie never got so much attention in his life. Now, Charlie and Ruthie belonged to ASCAP, the the royalties company. And he told me all this about how the songwriter is paid when their song is performed or when the record is produced. That's where he got his money. And when Charlie and that Hot Rod Lincoln got debuted around the area, the radio stations were all over Hot Rod Lincoln continuously. It was unbelievable. Every channel, every station, every television station was all over it. There was all this excitement just off what we created from the restoration and having the car available for the people to actually look at and see. The Ryans wrote countless letters and cards thanking all the people that brought life to him and and his wife and bringing the car to the way it was originally meant to be. They'd never had the time or money to do it because they were so busy just trying to make a living. He got on the television show Nashville Now, and the car was rolled out onto the stage while Charlie performed the song. He'd never done anything like that before, and it was the first time the car had ever been shown to the general public on national television. The magazine coverage was amazing as well. Now, they had moved to Spokane to live after the car was done. He asked to join, oh, he was asked to join the Duke's Car Club, and of course he was thrilled. In 1990, Rod and Custom Magazine did their story on the Hot Rod Lincoln, including pictures of before, during, and after the restoration. Uh, some of the photographs in that article was sent to them by some of the workers, and of course, I gave them all the pictures that I had developed from a little snapshot camera that we were using at the time. Charlie and Ruthie wrote a lot of songs. If you listen to their, one of their tapes, there's a sidecar Sally and a lot of others. Ruthie was a heck of a songwriter, too. Now, Charlie never had a lot of money, and he was getting up there in years. The song Hot Rod Lincoln might live forever, but Charlie knew that he wouldn't, so Charlie and Ruthie gave the car to a car collector in Chicago in return for his promise to take care of Ruthie during her remaining years. Whether she was in a nursing home or wherever, he paid the bills in return for that car. Charlie passed away of a heart attack in 2008. He and Ruthie had been married for over 70 years. Wow. Apparently, Ruthie has passed away by now because I haven't heard from her in quite some time. I used to get greeting cards from her every Christmas, but she was getting older and older, too. The Hot Rod Lincoln was the star. It was the star hot rod of the 60th Detroit Autorama in 2012, and Barrett Jackson states the car was sold at auction in January of 2013 at the Scottsdale Barrett Jackson auction for $106,700. Wow. While Charlie and Ruthie are gone, the car is still out there someplace, and I hope in loving hands. The song with its iconic lyrics is still on the airwaves, and it'll live in the hearts of many forever. Now, that story is by Bob Davidson, and I got a postscript. 
Well, I was doing some research for the show and for this particular story. I found that on YouTube, there is a video of a guy who actually currently owns the car. Wow. His name is Bob Demanone, I think is how you pronounce it, D-E-M-A-N-O-N-E. Um, and he's got a, it, the video shows him showing the car currently. I mean, it's within, the, within a year. And it's still in terrific shape. It runs. The sound of that V12 flathead motor cranking up is just awesome. But in his description of the car and the history of the car and the rebuild, there's some things that aren't quite right based on this story. So here's what we've done. Number one, this show is going to be posted, and by the time you're hearing this, of course, it will be on the air. Um, I also linked that video to our Facebook page and to the, the show page so that you can see the video and actually see what the car looks like and see the guy who owns it. And I am contacting him to let him know that the old Car Nut book v- version 2 or volume 2 is where the original story is because I think that'll help him to have you know full, you know, full bore information. And of course, I'll send him a link to the show in case he wants to you know do that as well. But I just think it is tremendous that the guy has the car. Yes. And it's not sitting in a barn someplace or sitting in some little place. He's taking it out. He recognizes the legend, and he, he wants people to sit in it. He thinks it's marvelous that everybody comes up and fiddles with it. It's not a, a no-touch mirrored show car. It's a it's a, a touchy-feely kind of a car, which is a, exactly what it should be. You know, an icon like that, there's only one. You know, there's only one. And there's another story that, relates to kind of how that how the song originally got started that I didn't know apparently it was a response to an earlier uh car race song called Hot Rod Race. Oh. And I didn't know that that was anything relation but I remember that song and if I think about it between now and when we put the show on the air I will see if I can get a link to Hot Rod Race and put it up there it could be kind of fun to you know to look at listen to them both cuz I remember both songs. All right. And here's a personal <laughs> piece of trivia. When I was a kid, I loved this song. And I knew all the words to the entire thing and would regularly sing it to the dismay of my old man, especially when we were driving. He'd like, "Do you? can you stop singing that song? <laughs> well, <laughs> no, because I kind of like the idea. I guess I was born to be a car guy. But um, as we always say when we do these stories, uh, you know, the old car nut book is filled with magnificent stuff about lots of things having to do with the automotive uh, the hobby. David Dixon has three uh, stories, and there are, in fact, um, uh, they're all available on Amazon or in the old car com, so that you uh, could make a really wonderful Christmas present. If, in fact, if you ordered now, it won't get there for Christmas, but it'd be pretty darn close. <laughs> and it'd be worthwhile to have all three of them on your on your bookshelf. Steve is making f- hand gestures at me. What do you got? Well, you found Hot Rod Race? Oh. We may put a link to Hot Rod Race <laughs> before the end of the show. Stay with us. How much time have we got before the break? I have no idea where I'm at. Oh, this is it? Okay, here we go. Oh, th- so this is Hot Rod Race. Oh, man, my wife and my brother Joe took off in my Ford from San Pedro. We hadn't much gas to there you go. Low, but the doggone Ford could really go. We left San Pedro late one night. About See? About the middle of the night, we were ripping along like white folks might. When a murky behind, he blinked his lights. He honked his horn and he flew out of sight. There you go. I remember this. In the Columbia, but you people may think that I'm in a rut. But to you folks who don't dig the jive, that's two carburetors and an overdrive. <laughs> we made grease spots out of many good town and left the cops' head spinning around and around. They wouldn't chase, they'd run in the hide, but me and that mercury stayed side to side. Uh, we were Ford men and we likely knew that we would race until something blew and we <laughs> thought it over now, wouldn't you? <laughs> I looked down at my lovely bride, her face was blue, I thought she had died. We left streaks through towns about 40 feet wide, but me and that mercury stayed side to side. There were several versions of this song. Well, this one is by Arky Shilby. Okay. Shibley. 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 Arky Shibley. What a name. That's a country name there. Well, Mercury and Lincoln, they're both Ford. Yeah. Yeah. I can really see a big 
similarity between. Well, sure. I mean, he obviously took a lot of the. It was the country. Ideas. Ideas. What do you call this style? Well, uh, rockabilly. rockabilly. Yeah. Yeah. Rockabilly. yeah. Sure. yeah. Just a hopped up Model A. You know, Little Richard, the uh, rock and roll singer and the icon of the 50s, and later, of course, he said that the whole idea of rock and roll was a marriage between country and blues. Country and blues yeah. had a baby, and they turned they called it rock and roll. Yep. <laughs> hey, stick with us. We got more coming. This is the greatest automotive info show in the known world. It's horsepower, chrome, and rust. Hi, this is Adam Kramer from Avance.com. You're listening to Horsepower, Chrome, and Rust. Had my money, i tell you what I'd do. I would go downtown and buy a mic red too. Cause I'm crazy about a mic red. Now, <laughs> I'm not sure if anybody remembers this song. But crazy about Steve a mercury. Miller Steve Miller, yeah. Made this huge in the 70s. Yeah. But this Alan is Jackson a 1952 a version by K.C. Douglas, probably yeah. the originator. Yeah, he wrote it. And I know Alan Jackson, the country guy, did a version of it later on, too. That's the thing about these car songs. You know, everybody wants a piece of it because they're just fun. They are. You know, we actually, we should do a whole show about car songs. I think that'd be great. <laughs> we'd, we'd be sending checks to ASCAP and BMI forever. <laughs> hey. hey, so we're at Cars Confidential. Um, uh Actually, we're back with a story from Lance Lambert uh, this week, simply because cool. it, I, we just spent some time reading a really great story from the old car nut books, and I thought, well, we'll give Lance you know, some love. This one is actually from his uh, Fenders, Fins, and Friends, uh, Confession of a Car Guy, which is a great piece of work, by the way. A lot of, lot of quick, snappy stories in there from all kinds of folks. Most of these actually are Lance's. So, uh, And because I'm a member uh, of the Steeds Car Club... Steeds. I thought that that's not studs, I, right? Well, maybe it depends on who you talk to. Yes, um, you know, Lance <laughs> would certainly agree. <laughs> yes, <laughs> your wife would too. And, well, and you know, one thing that we are, you know, and you have to put this right on the on the bumper sticker is we, steeds are humble. That's right. We're humble. If you look <laughs> up humble in the dictionary, that's us. Um, well, you know, a steed is another name for a horse, and horses are well. We well, won't go any yeah, further. there's also that whole thing about what you pick up after horses in the parade, and that, yeah. that may fit <laughs> us as well. Anyway, this one is called Corvette Miracle, <laughs> and uh, it's, a, it's a good one. It's the summer of 1964, and a miracle was about to happen. The Steeds Car Club had been in existence for more than two years, and all was going pretty well. We had about 15 active members. We were one of the best car clubs in Tacoma, and the membership included some great guys with great cars. What we didn't have was a member with a Corvette. Now, I always watched for prospective members among the local hot rod community, and I found that most guys were eager to join the club. But what I hadn't found out, or found at all, was a guy who owned Chevrolet's finest. Now, car guys now in high school may not know what a Corvette meant to a guy in 1964. There was no more prestigious car to own than a vet. I mean, when one drove by, you stopped whatever you were doing and you just watched the car until it dissolved into a speck on the horizon. Just sitting in a Corvette was better than driving a lot of other cars. And then, then it happened. Somebody with a Corvette expressed an interest in coming to a Steeds Car Club meeting. This was not some greaser kid from the neighborhood who drove a $50 beater. This was a well-known guy with a much-admired car Byron melted girls' hearts whenever he walked down the hall at school and filled the guys with envy whenever they saw him driving his Corvette and, miracle of miracles, he wanted to attend the Steeds meeting. I was the current club president. I wanted to make sure that we made the right impression on Byron. I called most of the members and asked them to be sure to attend the next meeting and be on their best behavior. I told everyone to treat him normally and not any differently than any other guy, even though he was obviously, due to owning a Corvette, uh, a better human being than any of us. <laughs> well, of course, uh, it goes without saying. You know, it's funny how <clears throat> teenagers yes, yes. Think, think cars, don't we? <laughs> well, this reminds me of, of Titus's story about his 
chrome Corvette jacket, but that's a whole separate <laughs> yeah. thing. The next meeting found us standing around and waiting for the arrival of every teenage boy's fantasy. Byron drove up in his 64 Corvette Stingray and was greeted with nods of approval and an official welcome from the club's president. After the meeting ended, we all filed out to kick tires and show off whatever we had done to our cars since the previous week's meeting. Then it happened. Byron said he'd like to join the club. Well, this was big. This was like, well, having a guy with a Corvette say he wanted to hang out with you, well, (laughs) the only thing bigger would be a girl with a Corvette saying she wanted to hang out with you. (laughs) That thought was so exciting, I can't expound on what effect that would have had on me. Uh, The next meeting arrived, and Byron was unanimously voted in as a new member. He went on to be one of the club's best members, eventually became its president. 1963 Corvettes still raise my pulse rate. And I think of Byron and his Stingray whenever I hear the rumble of a 60s Corvette. Now, it's interesting that he would say a 1963 Stingray raises his pulse because Byron had a 64. Right. And as we all know, and please tell me we all know this, the 63 Stingray was the only split window, window. rear window car that Chevrolet made. And, and it is, let's face it, an icon. Yes. And back in the day... As horrible as this sounds, when 64 came around, there were a lot of people who breathed a sigh of relief because you couldn't see Jack out of the back window, you know, in the in the split windows because the, the thing was right in the middle of where the rearview mirror showed right. the picture. But it was cool. So when the 64s came out and they did not have the split, there was actually, by 1965, there was a kit you could get to cut post out of the 63s oh, wow. and make it you could fit the 64 65 wow. windows yeah people did it because you know the 63 was looked as kind of an anomaly right now of course if you tell anybody you did that you're lynched there's like people will kill you for doing stuff like that you what you cut the split out of that's kind of like putting moon um uh what do you uh, the, the you take and put a uh sun sunroof in, oh. in, into into cars and all of a sudden yeah. now it leaks after yes. a while yeah, yeah, yeah. and well, uh, you know it's I mean sure of course you could you could make a mess pretty easily but this was just something that people did for the sake of the cosmetics well right and the whole point of the of the sixty three was that it was an icon and remains one today I mean it, you know and the funny thing about Corvettes I like them you know I mean you, you can't sort of not like them and there is an attitude about them to some people but. Suspension wise, it took it was like the fourth generation before those things actually started to handle pretty well. The sixty three is rode like a truck. Right. But they were Corvettes. That's so how you put up with it. <laughs> you know, a lot of fast even the Cobra didn't handle as well as maybe you might think about it. The ones now are well, they're straight line cars. Yeah. You weren't supposed to be autocrossing those things, <laughs> but well, and they did. did. Yeah. I but, mean you, you see the old Corvettes and they're just, just screeching around the corners. Well not and, with stock suspension. No, they, they had they, a lot yeah. of improvement. Yeah. Everything did. Sure. I mean, look, how how long was it before they put disc brakes in front of a Mustang? They were drum brakes for a long time. Long, yep. Chevelles, they had the, the disc drums brakes. and of and, death. Yes. Yes. Well, you know, I mean, everything gets a little better with time. And even now, you know, people say, oh, the new Chargers are nothing like the old ones. The old ones are cool. Yeah, but you could die in those things because there was no airbags. There was no, you know, the crumple zones were different. And, eh, it's it's not the same sort of well, thing. Well, in, in thinking of icons and, and interesting cars that maybe have gone by, I came across this really interesting Hemmings Car of the Week. Oh, yeah? is a 76, get this, completely restored Pacer. Oh, sure, I mean, the inside and out, the AMC fishbowl. Pacer. Yeah, the fishbowl. And it's got the beautiful red. They did some uh, nice little bit of body work on it. And to be honest, it's a very... Cute looking vehicle compared to the one I drove, it was just white yeah. back in uh, 78. The Pacers were underrated. Uh, well, they, actually, they, put, they, they weren't put, bad little cars. No, and they put in a uh, Chrysler transmission yeah. and yeah. a rebuilt crate motor into this yeah. thing. So, what, 318 or what? Uh, I think something like that. Like yep. Small block. Yep, small block. And it's going for how much do you think they're asking for this? Oh, what year? 78? 76. 76 Pacer rebuilt. All completely creator. rebuilt, interior, exterior, uh, everything. I don't know. I'm, I'm going to go 35. 11K. Really? Yes. 11K. It started the bid, and it's already going. I'll be done. Well, of course, that's not what it's going to end up at. No. Interesting. Well, you know, that would be worth it. There was a 69 396 SS Camaro, all original numbers matching, at 57 grand asking price. Yeah. Well, numbers matching. And that was a good year for them, too. But that's 
that's I would have thought they wanted more for the thing. Well, I've it, it, they're certainly all in that bank, you know, um, in that neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. So I thought we would finish off. Oh, you have more music. Oh. See, when we do at next year, folks, you have to you got to be with us when we go live on YouTube. You'll be able to see all of this gesticulating that Steve is because you know we're sitting here talking and it sounds normal. He's all over there making hand gestures. That look at what I found and listen to this. And he's looking up junk on the computer. You'll see this all in video. It's not as exciting as it sounds. What do you got here? Yeah, see, this is the one. A little Rye Cooter. Yeah, this is the one that I remember. I don't know about Rye Cooter's version, but this song. Yeah, Crazy About a Mercury. <laughs> well, you just don't get tired of these songs. Now, we seriously, we could do a show on on Hot Rod Tunes. It wouldn't take okay. much at we'll, all. Okay, we'll make that a, a point. <laughs> Hey, the weekly trivia question's up next. Take a peek at next week's show as well. Put it in park, stick around. We will be back. .com. Help us if you can. You're an El Camino. El Camino man. Only you can understand. Welcome back to Around the Wheel, where we talk about upcoming events, weekly trivia question. And I'm having a hard time talking tonight because uh, I've got some issues with some oral surgery I had, and my mouth oh, that's is right. a blah, you blah, had blah, blah, blah. Teeth moved and everything else. Removed. And you had your nose yeah. Put oh on the other gosh. side of your head. And, yeah. Yep, that happens yeah. sometimes. Steve is on marvelous pain meds. It's amazing that he can put three words together, actually. Ibuprofen and Tylenol. Yeah, yeah. But, but six <laughs> and of antibiotics. them. Antibiotics. Like <laughs> <laughs> my wife said, no, you can't take more than two or four. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Today. Today. Yeah. Yes. Well, you know, it's it it's never fun to do that kind of stuff. I mean, I've we've all gone through a, a dental, you know, <laughs> yeah, s- cereal, and it's it's a <sighs> you don't feel good until two days later, or um, two weeks later in my yeah, case. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so coming up, uh, we do have a a whole bunch of great events that are happening. Um, th- we just were talking off air about uh, the fact that we're going to be live pretty soon on a radio station down the road, and uh, it'll be a chance to hear the show. Uh, live as well as and we're internet. going to be on youtube as well and we'll be on youtube year. um but one of the places that uh we will not be yet uh at least live is ontario canada mm. however the reason i mention ontario canada is because johnny garfield lives in ontario and he is the guy who came up with the answer for the trivia question from last week wow and the question was where did the first peanuts characters of course being the christmas time you know everybody's the peanuts right. christmas is you know iconic but where was it that they were first animated they first showed up as an animation in what and the answer was in 1957 for a ford fairlane automobile commercial wow. and it was around christmas when the thing was released and uh, johnny was the first guy to come up with that one and uh, several other people had the same answer you can look it up obviously but uh, yeah the first peanuts characters were animated in 1957 wow um, for a Ford commercial, and and there you have it. So congratulations to Johnny. His name's going to go up on the Magic uh, Barn Find Dust wall, and uh, Shane's uh, handsome mug will be standing there holding the <laughs> yes. holding the uh, can of dust. Uh, this week I got a good one. Th- this for your New Year's trivia question. Here you go. This is not easy. Everybody knows. Everybody knows what the first commercial racetrack in the world, well, in America, was. Everybody knows. I don't know. Yes, you do. You know this. Okay. The first commercial, the number one automobile racetrack in the U.S. was the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Okay. And it was also known as the Brickyard. I was just going to say the Brickyard. Because, yes, because it had bricks. It was actually cobblestones when they first built it. Now, the, none of the Brickyard still exists. I mean, it does, but it's not part of right. the track anymore. Right. But the question is, the question is, how many cobblestones? On the brickyard. Oh my gosh! <laughs> and uh, it's, Steve is—he's being very diplomatic. So, oh my gosh! You should see the hand gestures he's giving me off. Wow! <laughs> it's like you can't ask a question. Yes, I can. And as a matter of fact, you can get the answer if you went to Indy because they have that on the wall down there. You and were there. Somebody, I, yeah, I'm lucky enough to have been there. Um, 
But yeah, they have it on the wall along with some of the bricks, of course, original sure. and stuff. And every other kind of magical race trophy is there, too. But So if you know, you can get with us at uh, horsepowerchromeandrust.com. You can uh, contact us at horsepowerchromeandrust.com for the email. You can answer us on the Facebook page. You can send me a messenger thing. You can um, I, There's all kinds of smoke signals would work, anything that's reasonably close. You know, speaking of cobblestones, yes. we were in Boston uh, two summers ago. Yeah. And there are original, and we were in Delaware, and yes. we were in a very few of these um, very historical spots, and there are there were cobblestones that yes. were original. Oh, yeah. And then I remember growing up in Ferndale, we'd go to Bellingham all the time, and it was called Railroad Avenue, and that whole thing right. was red brick. Yes. Oh, yeah. With uh, the railroad tracks right down Well, there's down a lot the of red brick down at Pike, uh, Pike Place Market. And Pike Street Market uh, as well. In uh, Seattle, sure. And a lot of the older places. Yep. Hey, we still got openings for sponsors, and it's a great opportunity to reach about a million people every week. Thank you to David Dickinson and Lance Lambert for allowing us to read stories from their books this week. And thank you for liking and following our website and our Facebook page. We are going to be back with a New Year's special next week. For Shane Osborne and Steve Johan, I'm Brady Wright saying keep your eyes on the road, your hands on the wheel, and your foot to the floor. Next week, we do it again on Horsepower Chrome and Rust.